out of order. Just about right there is good. So arm straight out. Do me a favor and just grab that. Look at that. Actually, you can land until you have to land the front one. Okay. For participating. Thank oh, you. I was good at that. Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're uh, going to do a panel on affiliate marketing's role in media plans. And the whole purpose of that little demonstration was to give you an idea of control. Um, five years ago, had I tried to do that, I probably would have hit him in the head and the helicopter would have ended up looking like this. And so keep that in mind. Um, that's going to be a theme about affiliate marketing's role in media plans. You can really control your media spend. I'd like to start by uh, introducing the panel. I'm Paul Schroeder, I'm with PS Web Solutions. I've been doing uh, internet advertising for about 15 years and about the last 12 of those has been uh, affiliate marketing specifically. Um, I'm based out of Salt Lake City. I've uh, worked with clients such as um, the Blue Man Group, um, Orc, the vacuum cleaning company in Tabasco. Um, in 2003, I started an association in our area of affiliate marketers that meets monthly, discusses the best practices, and I'm just happy and pleased to be in this uh, industry, and I'm just happy to be here. Um, on my right, I'll let Brad introduce himself. Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Brad Brewster. I'm the uh, founder and president of Net Media, a New Orleans-based uh, interactive agency. Uh, like Paul, I've been in the industry about 15 years. Work with a lot of uh, brand marketers, direct marketers, we do like e-commerce and help our clients with online media. Had the uh, pleasure of working with some really great brands over the years: uh, Lands End, Kraft, Tabasco, Work, and uh, many others. So glad to be here. Hi, I'm Chris Kramer. I'm one of the founding partners of NetX. We're a digital marketing agency based out of New York, and uh, I've been in the affiliate marketing space since 1998. And uh, we work with clients like Dick Sporting Goods, Red Roof Inn. Audible.com, Vision of Amazon, and about 30 different affiliate programs uh, to manage uh, all aspects of the performance market. Uh, okay, um, so as you can see, we have a pretty, a pretty good panel here. Um, some, some expertise that stretches back for quite some time. And uh, before we start getting this discussion, I'd like to uh, do a few housekeeping announcements. I was asked to remind everyone to please um, provide some feedback about the session and let uh, Sean and Missy know if it was valuable or not. And then we're scheduled to end at 4.30. Um, we're going to try to do questions and answers at the end. And if it goes over a little bit, um, we're, we're more than happy to go over. And when we end, feel free to come up and ask us uh, individual questions if you'd like. Um, going back to the little demonstration to start, the whole idea of control um, is something that uh, I don't know that a lot of VPs of marketing or C-level executives understand that it is possible in, in uh, media plans. Uh, I come from a media background uh, where we would do TV buys and outdoor and print and whatnot, and it was all very much a, a branding um, approach. But nowadays, you can really control your media spend, and uh, a technologist um, Tom DeMarco said that you can't control what you can't measure. And that's one of the beauties of affiliate marketing is it's, it's completely measurable. Um, so let's start to look at a, a couple of things to consider when your company is looking at uh, the role of affiliate marketing in its, in its media plan. Um, there are what I call the five P's, profit margins, paradigms, perceptions, politics, and programs. And we will discuss each of these um, and welcome any questions that you might have on these. Um, so when you're starting a company, the I think the best scenario for anyone who's starting a company would be to have a sales force that is willing to be paid on commission only. Um, how nice would it be to, to hire people that are willing to take all the risk and put all the effort into it and only be paid on commission. That really takes the, uh, the risk out of the company owner's hands. Um, affiliates really are 
just like commission only salespeople. And that's something uh, that it, it becomes self funding and it's a profit center. And we'll discuss the idea of affiliate marketing and the affiliate program being considered a profit center as opposed to a, an expense. Okay, let's talk about uh, profit margins, if we may. Um, when you're making sales uh, as a company, you have different places where the sales can come from. You, you produce a widget, and that widget is, is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you have to find a distributor to, to get your product out there on the market. Um, he will then, or she will, take it to retailers, resellers, or if they uh, are savvy, then they'll build a website and be able to sell direct. Now, of those four, for uh, opportunities to sell, which do you think is the most profitable? I mean, obviously it's kind of a loaded question. Um, when, when you produce something, you have different people that want to touch that product and get a piece of the pie. Um, in this slide here, it shows the, the product manufacturer, an agent or a broker, wholesaler, retailer, and then finally for the consumer. Now, if you're someone who creates their own product and can sell it directly online, you cut out those three people who touch that, that uh, piece of the pie and your profit margins are going to skyrocket. Um, so let's talk about each of these first. The first few slides, we're going to get set the tone and then we're going to get some discussion going here. Um, when you work with a distributor, um, the distributor doesn't share the information really. The distributor, I guess, just takes that product and, and puts it out to the different channels. But when you're giving it to them, you're giving up a huge portion of your margins. Um, and then with retailers, it's the same thing. The retailers provide value because they have the brand themselves. And the product then gets a bump from being associated with that retailer. But the retailer sells it, and you, as the company owner, don't know who's buying. You don't have any of the customer data in your and You're giving up a, a big portion of that revenue. Um, and then the reseller, same thing. It's a little less uh, formal relationship. Uh, but you're still giving up a, a large portion of those sales. And if you if you had that brand recognition, you wouldn't have to go through those sales channels. And if you could, then you'd remove all those um, those links within that value chain and simply sell direct to the consumer. But that's not not typically the case. You you have to have these different distribution channels to make the sales. So let's talk about this now. This this kind of shows um, what percentage of the profit margins you're willing to give up. Um, it shows the distributor, retailer, the reseller, and then the selling direct and, and what effect that has. Let's talk about each of these then. I know that you guys have different experience with some of your clients. Um, what have you seen when it comes to these different sales channels and, and affiliate marketing? Yeah, I mean, one thing is that you definitely, there's never a one size fits all. Every industry, every brand is gonna have some different scenario that they've uh, either inherited or that they've developed along the way. Um, channel conflict is always a concern of, of any brand. They, they're always, uh, there's always a concern of anybody selling uh, direct to consumer that they may be undercutting uh, some of their, their sales partners. And uh, especially if they have a, an established uh, amount of sales or revenue coming through the door. So whenever a new channel is introduced, there's some trepidation within the company of uh, whether or not this is going to, at the end of the day, add or um, you know maybe take away from, from the existing sales. Okay. And so, you, have you seen stuff like that in uh, dealing with your clients as well? Brad? Certainly, and uh, I think their opinions vary based on you know if someone's a direct marketer, or an e-commerce player. Their, their attitude is usually much different than maybe a traditional manufacturer or brand marketer who's got lots of distribution channels and how well they understand their own like, cost per acquisition and that they're the factors in this as well. Yeah, I, I remember in the mid to late 90s, um, I was working for uh, local newspapers and they I was building their online sales channel and I guess Nordstrom had some trepidation about selling directly online because it would affect their franchisees. And, you know, it would come a long way since then, but it's still amazing to me how often I hear no, we can't do that because it will impact this other channel, even though that other channel is far less um, profitable. You just reminded me, you bring up a great, uh, one of our clients had a, as many of our clients do, has a ongoing program trying to build their own list, email list, database marketing. 
and their, their own online e-commerce channels are separate from that. Uh, when, when you look at some of this issue and the kinds of stuff, look, you, you can acquire customers online, we can put the data over to the brand marketing side, the relationship side, and kind of, kind of, you know, put the whole program in a better light and better metrics to, to rate it. And it seems kind of absurd now to, to hear a retailer that size to think that they couldn't sell direct. Um, you, you're seeing less and less of that concern in that, in a, an example that everybody feels like they can sell direct, they just have to navigate you know, very carefully through uh, some of the politics involved. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting to me. I still see people um, in my area that don't sell directly online. I, I know a, a very large manufacturer, very well recognized brand name, that uh, they only sell through other people's sites. And so this, this brand name it happens to be in uh, luggage, in bags, and that sort of thing. And, and um, you go to their site, and it looks very nice, and it, it feels like an e-commerce site. But you get to the point where you're ready to purchase, and they push them over to e-bags. And so it's, it's amazing to me that they're producing their own uh, um, products, and they have great brand recognition if they're not selling direct but it still happens. There just seems to be a transformation really over the last 10 years. Most of my brand marketers now are thinking more. So once you get online, everything's trackable. You inherently become more like a direct marketer or you know, e-commerce peer player. It just happens so that you know, all roads are sort of leading to that, some type of transaction online, including just a handoff to a reseller or a yeah, do you remember the, the old argument before? I remember spelling, I, they're spending, I used to spend a quarter of a million dollars a month for one of my first true dot com companies that I worked for. And um, they really were the first time that I'd seen, they, they were still kind of focused about the impression and getting out in front. There was this whole argument of branding versus direct response. And so you do media buys based on cost per thousand. And I had just barely started uh, to transition over to saying, you know, why, why would we do this? We have this metrics that you can track it and understand what's profitable for you and what's not. And I come from the uh, more traditional agency side where they would spend millions of dollars on, on TV ads, and the Super Bowl ad and, and things like that. And now, you know, spending $250,000 a month, I'm looking at that saying, okay, which portions of this ad spend are the most cost effective? And people, you know, up to that point, I would have salespeople coming in, they'd say, nobody holds me to these metrics that you're holding me to. And I would say, well, get used to it. And uh, it just kind of has to be that way. There was that transition, and this was like in the early 2000s. Yeah, I mean, we started in 2001, and we've always been a customer acquisition agency. That's the only thing we've ever done. So if you want branding, like nobody would ever hire us. We, um, we're all about getting customers online for our clients. So. We never really faced that hurdle. We already, a client came to us, we already knew what their goal was. We would work with them to, of course, know how much they could afford to spend per customer, what the quality of the customer would be, what channels are we going to get these customers from, whether it's search or display or affiliate um, or other online means. Okay. Um, so, again, when we're talking about profit margins, to um, be putting more time and effort, focus on these distribution or distribution channels that are less profitable, is just simply giving away margins. Um, and there are a lot of companies that are willing to give, you know, 35 to 50 percent to dealers or somebody that there's nothing more than a glorified affiliate. Yet they're hesitant to give, you know, a third of that amount to affiliate because. They just don't quite understand what they're getting with an affiliate or their politics or other things that we'll talk about a little bit later. But it amazes me that people are so willing to bend over backwards for other distribution channels when they're really virtually no less uh, legitimate than the affiliate channel. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of companies are very used to affiliates being the most efficient channel for them and for them to you know, start upping that percentage and maybe having it equal to some of their other acquisition costs. Um, it may not work for them. Um, I see a lot of cases where uh, as efficient as affiliate is, they're still trying to drive that cost down even further. Um, I think the spread between the lowest acquisition costs and the most expensive ones is getting a little bit bigger. Um, and in a lot of cases, the you know, affiliate is you know, helping to fund the higher cost per acquisitions of doing display or TV or something other. Yeah, it, it supplements that. You uh, brought something up last night as we were discussing this, that I found interesting. It's the, you have to understand who's providing what value. 
and the idea of compensating them based on the value that they uh, they provide. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Every affiliate is not the same. Um, you have you have if you work with coupon sites or loyalty sites or publishers who develop their own you know rich content. Um, you know somebody who has a coupon at the if, if, if there's a customer out there doing a search for the brand term plus coupon, uh, that the client may have gotten that cut. The brand may have gotten that customer anyway. So we'll look at that and we'll say, you know, maybe that, that affiliate deserves a little bit less. Or if we track the long-term life, the lifetime value of that of the customers that this affiliate is driving. If I have uh, an affiliate driving three purchases per customer versus one purchase per customer, we're going to pay that affiliate more money. And that you bring up lifetime value, and it's interesting to me. I, w I was talking about lifetime value when this shift happened from a branding perspective to a, a direct marketing perspective, direct response. And a lot of companies don't understand the lifetime value. Uh, I think they're getting better at it now, but you would bring up the idea of lifetime value and you'd get a blank stare. It was, it was crazy. And we work with a lot of publishing clients, so if you're marketing a subscription product, you need to know how long somebody stays subscribed if you're going to base your payout on a certain expectation that that customer is going to be around for six months, a year, or two years. And if you're paying every affiliate or every channel the same exact amount, um, you're really you know, not doing the, the most efficient job. Yeah, and it, it becomes really important to understand your metrics as a company, too, because if you understand that lifetime value, you can be a little bit more aggressive in what you offer an affiliate payout. Um, but if you don't understand that, then yeah. you're going to find yourself there. One of the first clients I ever worked on was the New York Times, and you actually you know, were involved in that business. And um, this is a company that had 100 years of history of knowing what a customer was worth to them. Um, that you know, people had been subscribing to this product for literally over 100 years. So it was very easy for them to know that when somebody starts a subscription, they're going to stay on for you know, 5, 10, 15 years or you know, you know, however, however many weeks. So. Yeah, and then now you have all these new companies that have different business models and they don't, they don't really know how long someone's going to stay on. I was talking with somebody yesterday and uh, they've got a new music streaming service. I said, that's great. It's going to be subscription based. It's going to be a pretty low price point, I think $6.95. And I said, so how much, how long are they going to stay on? He said, that's a big question. You, you, when you have a, something that's untested, it, it gets to be a little trickier. And what we're seeing as a rule of thumb is generally about three months worth of whatever the consumer is paying is a pretty typical affiliate payout. Um, it's you know not a one size fits all, but that's a pretty good place to start. And each industry is going to have their own you know uh, structure like that. Uh, just looking at what your competitors are paying. You know, if you're an online retailer, look at what a, a you know if you sell shoes, look at the, the closest competitor is, is paying, and that's a good starting point. And then look evaluating what those customers are actually doing after the fact, uh, and, and adjusting as you go along. Thanks. Um, and then one thing that uh, that Brad has brought up in our many discussions is the idea that uh, affiliates actually need to be more efficient than a lot of your own in-house efforts, um, just so that they can survive. Because if they're not that efficient, they won't have the profit to be able to, to do what they do. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? If that's something. Well, yeah, that's something we're trying to educate our clients is, you know, affiliates are actually doing the same thing we're doing on my marketing. A lot of times they do it better than us. They're more efficient than we are. And they have to be because they're living in that spread you know, between our cost per acquisition and, you know, the payout. And um, it's really kind of setting the tone so you respect the, the affiliate and the network and, and it's more of a partnership. And I know you have a slide that later, sometimes when it comes to commissions or what have you, affiliate can have stigma, and you, know, you have to work around that with certain clients. Yeah, it's almost like they're, they're a threat to them because, um, frankly, a lot of times affiliates do things better than than uh, the internal staff can. And yeah, whether it's SEO you know, or, you know, and that's it's just part of the mentality that we can't be everywhere. We have limited budgets. We have to work with, with partners where to take it further and do things, either complement what we're doing and, you know, and, and expand our reach. Um, so this is just a, a slide representation of the um, sales, and it's a pie chart where the sales go. Um, sorry, I apologize for the uh, font size, it's not very, very good on that, but if you ha have, for instance, uh, the majority of your sales going through a retail channel, and you're giving up a huge portion of your margins, you're giving up 40% plus, and your um, affiliate is in this 15% range, would you not want to increase that 15% to say 25 or 30% of your business um, and take some of that away from the, the retailer channel? When I bring that up, the, the general idea, if you're an agnostic CEO that just or a CFO that's looking at the numbers, you say, of course, I want to do that. 
because I want to, the company to make as many sales as profitable as possible. It's not always that easy though because you have one of the other keys which is politics that uh, gets in the way because people will protect their own um, fiefdom if you will. So, and th there are paradigms as well. Uh, we need to look at the, the paradigm of the uh, overall media spend um, as a whole and where affiliates fits in there. Um, this is a chart that shows the US major media ad spending and you can see most everything, newspapers, radio, magazines, directories out there, they're all flat. The uh, top two being internet and TV are trending upward. Um, so that's a, a good sign, but the, the old thing that uh, you always hear is half the money I spend on advertising is wasted, the trouble is I don't know which half. And that's still happening unless you're doing DRTV or, or something that is trackable, that TV ad spend is all just I, this many people saw it and it's more of a branding and it's kind of putting your finger up and, and testing the wind and hoping that you're, you're making your money back on that. But with the internet advertising spend, it, it's going to be trackable uh, unless you're in the old CPM um, arena. But even that, you can reverse the metrics and, and figure out you know, what sold and which traffic source on that. So, um, traditional media focuses on branding metrics. They're looking for audience ratings, media share, reach, frequency, gross rating points, readership. I remember cuts and puts, which is households using television and persons using television, all those old metrics. Um, online media focuses on different metrics. Clicks, click-through rate, cost per click revenue, CPA, ROAS. Um, some of our clients I know, one uses what they call MER, which is the media expense ratio. But what it comes down to is, how much money did I spend and how much money did I earn? I always tell people that, it's, it's pretty simple. In online media, especially affiliate marketing, you can know I can spend X and I'm gonna make two X or three X or five X or whatever it is. <coughs> the beauty about affiliate marketing is it's set. We had this discussion last night where paid search, you know, is a, a very effective um, place to, to spend your, your money, but it is variable. With affiliate marketing, it's consistent. Do you have anything else to say on that, or? No, I just, you know, we usually describe affiliate as the foundation for the, the, the entire media mix because it's gonna deliver the most efficient orders, and then, you know, it, but it's not an infinite supply, so on top of that, you'll add your paid search, you'll add your display, SEO, um, and all of these things combined will equal the, the, uh, the online acquisition. Yeah, and I always look at uh, affiliate as a microcosm of, of online media in general because affiliates are going to do a little bit of, of all of your online media. You'll have SEO affiliates, you'll have SEM affiliates, you'll have coupons, loyalties, sites, and, and things that you'll probably be doing anyway, but the most aggressive affiliates are, are the ones that uh, are more effective for you, or, or again, they're probably providing the most value because you're not doing it yourself. And a lot of times I've seen companies learn from their affiliates take what their affiliates are doing and then coordinate with them and, and bring that sort of uh, approach in house. Yeah, you could use, I mean, we're gonna break point. Sometimes uh, you can use affiliates to explore waters that either because of time, budget, or just predisposition, the client doesn't want to go there. And uh, you know, affiliates can test it out and uh, you know, oftentimes drive results and then prove the viability of whether it's email or some aspect of online marketing, they, yeah. for whatever reason, have to try. And you can get really strategic with how you, you utilize affiliates. Yeah, and one of our bigger clients is audible.com. They do downloadable audiobooks for your iPod. Um, and uh, we realized very early on that uh, podcasts would, would be very successful in advertising, but there really is not a big affiliate model for audio ads or podcasting. So we kind of had to start from scratch and develop our own technology that would enable affiliates to basically do a live read and say, you know, thanks for you know listening to Joe's podcast and go to joespodcast.com slash audible and get your free download. Um, and this was something that we really, you couldn't do you know, as a brand you, to just go out there and, and create your own podcast and create your own ads. And, um, you know, it's something that you know, affiliates have been very successful with and uh, creates a great um, additional source of Acquisition. Yeah, one thing that Brad and I have talked about over the years is uh, affiliates can become brand advocates. They're, they're evangelists. They really, really do a great job in endorsing your brand and in creative ways like that. Like 
podcast. And a lot of cases they can create a new uh, I guess, uh, uh, independent voice for the brand. So um, it's not just the brand saying that we're great, buy from us. It's something a third party saying, here are some great products that you can, that you can try. Yeah, and, and I've seen uh, some brands that have said, you know what, we're, we're doing great, we have a search team, we have this and we have that, but our search team doesn't want to deal with international, and then they will almost like subcontract that out to affiliates. And I've, I've known, uh, I know a brand that does 100,000 plus a month uh, through affiliate traffic internationally because their search team just isn't capable. Very, very few search agencies want to go beyond uh, Google and Bing. Um, they don't want to deal with third tier engines or you know, other traffic sources because it might only represent 2% of their total sales. An affiliate can step in and you know, they'll live in that 2%. Yeah. Also, too, is it related to uh, if you work with clients, sometimes uh, with brand restrictions, there's certain things you can do, can't say. And there's you know, words or phrases that are excluded. A lot of times, affiliate, you from the NCO side, they have a little bit more freedom, or could, could be if that's what you choose to do, is be kind of allow them to do things that you just aren't allowed to do in the official communications plan. I mean, within we reason, obviously. Yeah, and as long as it's in a controlled environment, you can really benefit your program or your company, but if you let it be a free reign scenario, you probably do more brand damage than good. Okay, uh, next slide. Performance-based marketing is considered an expense by most companies. This goes back to what I talked about, where if you were hiring uh, a sales board to start your company and you paid them commission only, then you wouldn't consider that commission an expense. That's a commission that's actually a profitable, a profit center. Um, so I, I mentioned here that I've recently heard companies that say, you know what, our accounting department has decided that the affiliate spend is not a media expense. It is considered a profit center and it actually comes out of the cost of goods sold on their balance sheet. And so it's a completely self-funding channel. And if you have that approach, I mean, it's amazing to me, we've talked about it before, where I think each of us have had clients that have said, you know what, we're approaching the end of our budget, so we can't accept any more affiliate sales. And, and it's crazy. It's, okay, so you're saying that if somebody sells this uh, $300 item for you and you give them $30, you just made $270, you're not going to take that, you know, you have to shut that off. I mean, and you mentioned that to me. Well, it's like, how many two cent nickels would you like to buy? Yeah. yeah. I'll take every one, you know, that you're not going to run out of money to buy, you know, to get profitable sales. Um, but it, it happens a lot. It's, it's almost, so, you know, the bigger the brand, the more common it is for this to be viewed as an advertising expense and therefore have a fixed budget. Um, and sometimes that budget, that, that was created months before and, when sales are bigger than expected, uh, there's no money left. And sometimes I've seen commission decreases. I've seen uh, conversations around, can you slow down the amount of sales that you're sending us? Um, and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're hired, uh, we were hired as an agency to drive new sales and better customers. Um, so to hear certain things like that, obviously, it becomes a big challenge. So having conversations with, with you know, as the highest levels of the company that you can around how you, this might be able to be viewed differently um, is really critical uh, if you're going to run into problems like this. Yeah, Brad and I over the years have kind of laughed about it. We know a client that said $5,000 a month to the affiliate channel. And it just, it's just remarkable that they can't look at it and say, okay, well, if we're spending $5,000 and making $20,000, why don't we spend 10 to make 40? You know, or see how high it scales. And it's just not the mindset of a larger corporation. And I can tell you, we were uh, cheering internally when we found out that one of our client's competitors had to shut their program down in the middle of their peak season because they ran out of money. Um, we seized that opportunity and communicated out to affiliates that, hey, we're still around and we're you know, still strong and picked up quite a few extra sales that peak season. And that's the risk you take. If you, if you cap your, your affiliate funding, then those sales are going to go somewhere else. Okay, uh, perceptions. Now, perception is something that uh, kind of evolved from the last 10 or 12 years since affiliate marketing's been around. Um, and there are some negative and some positive uh, perceptions, but there are surprisingly a lot of negative perceptions, especially in larger companies. Um, here are some of them that, that have been brought up. Uh, affiliates are somehow cannibalizing other channels. 
and I was just talking to somebody at buy.ad and, and he talked about how that's incremental sales and I've heard that for years and that's us in the industry we understand that it is incremental sales but the idea of cannibalizing on our other channels is, is a big concern um, and, and this thought just came to my mind if it is cannibalizing other channels who cares just because it's cannibalizing a channel that is much less profitable than this channel if you set your affiliate program upright it will be the most profitable channel you have um, working for you and if that's the case it's cannibalizing someone else's channel i'm sorry i i, I want to feel sorry for that person that's in charge of that channel but i don't the company should be going after those sales for the most profit would you or would you not agree with that i'd love to think it's always that simple but again you're know, talking about a lot of politics so I, I, i'm not sure the mix of you know advertisers versus uh you know affiliates in the room but um you know there inherently there's always some sort of politics or people feeling like they need to uh, you know, protect their area. Um, so uh, it's never quite as, as simple as that. Yeah, again, uh, I like to look at it and say, okay, if you were an agnostic CEO or CFO, what decision would you make? But it's never that simple. Be we, nice, but what? We, we try to have those conversations around, you know, let's, uh, let's acquire the greatest amount of quality customers at the most efficient rate. So where, where do we start? You know, can we get this percentage of sales from, from this area? Can we get it from this area? Um, you know, and usually starting with affiliate base again, because it is the most efficient. Okay, uh, another perception. Affiliate efforts are less legitimate than other efforts. This is one that you kind of joked about, Brad. For some reason, some people look at it and say, well, this cell is not as, as good as another cell because it came from affiliate. It's almost like it's a less than sale. You still made the same amount of money. How could it be less? But there's that perception. Yeah, I think it gets back into how you set the tone uh, and define what an affiliate is, and, and, and working with your affiliate manager to really I mean, educate your client to make sure that this is a partner. They're helping us because you know you have this is the next bullet, the commission. Sometimes combined with the commission, there's sometimes a bit of perception of well, affiliates doing you know what are they, we're doing or they're cashing in on our brand name or they're somehow leveraging other efforts that they have to pay for and if you really understand what an affiliate does and understand the work they have to put in and the media money they have to put out of pocket uh, you know you, you become much more sympathetic but I, I, I know it's your next bullet point I think that's something that commission percentage can really stick in uh, a client's mind or within an organization and sometimes it'll sort of float around I had a client uh, that was a direct marketer uh, they did have a commission sales uh, uh, base inside. Uh, this group had no opinion on the, the, the current CPA, the marketing group was paying for customers. They got wind of the commission, which uh, for the affiliate program, which of course defined what the CPA the payout would be, and it pretty much sank the program. Now, if I could do it all over again, I would have never mentioned the word commission uh, and a percentage, because they immediately combined it to the percentages they get up for the sale, and it's two different things. Yeah, and it becomes a threat where it's not really a threat, it's to be considered a police or whatever. Sort of yeah, that's, that's crazy. So commission can become a, a dirty word, and, and again, it comes down to politics and, and dealing with people's egos as well. I know that in that particular case, it was kind of, their, their egos were almost affronted in that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think we talked about that too. I don't know if that's kind of down the same line or. Yeah. No comment. <laughs> okay. okay, and then uh, there's an irrational fear of affiliates in general. You got the old perception of the affiliates uh, in their basement in their underwear, and that's they're just plugging away, and they're just this non-professional sort of sales tech. There's a tremendous amount of affiliate programs that either go unmanaged or undermanaged. So you know, it's not. It, it, I understand why. There are a lot of affiliate programs that don't know what their affiliates are doing because they haven't put the resources against it to actually work with these affiliates on a day-to-day -day basis and know that, yes, this is a strategic partner and this is how they're marketing our brand. Um, okay, you can have personal relationships with 5,000 or 10,000 different sites, but in most affiliate programs, it's a couple of hundred sites that are driving the vast majority of your sales. And if you staff your team correctly and can have you know, these relationships and actually understand how they're, what they're doing and how they're doing it and have those conversations, um, it, it is much more of a partnership than just, oh, we have these affiliates and we don't know what they're doing and, you know, what they're, they're, they're fitting on brand and we don't know, you know, maybe they're doing email. Um, it, it, when you're actually running your affiliate program proactively, those issues go away.
Yeah, I was going to say, and you have restrictions in place about here's what you can Absolutely. fit on, here's Clear what, here's, guidelines. here are the channels we want you in, it sort of eliminates. This, this is the first time that Brad has actually met affiliates, just, I can say that. Well, you know, I, was, I came and I, I met a few guys today, a super affiliate, it was like, I've always wanted to meet affiliates, my clients always ask me, well, you know, who are these people, you know, what do they look like, where are they, and it, the, the stereotype is, you know, the guy in his underwear in the bedroom, you know. Pounding away, and, and we were always be like, "Look, they're they're at marketers." She's like, "We are, but you know, they're going to the current channel." Yeah, and then I've explained, whole yeah, I mean, you know, I've explained, you know, hey, these guys know more about SEO than you do, and they're spending more on their marketing plans than you are. Um, you know, and it takes you know, it takes sometimes face-to-face -face meetings, and you know, it, it's it, it is a strategic relationship. It's not just you know, let me launch an affiliate program and see what happens. Yeah, there are affiliates out there that are spending six, seven figures a month in, in Google to promote their, their uh, merchants, and you know, there are a lot of companies that don't spend that much. Okay, so that's the perception of affiliate marketing in general and the negative perception of affiliate marketing. Now, how is affiliate marketing perceived by, by key players in the company? Uh, the company as a whole, you know, a lot of people may or may not even know that an affiliate program exists. Sales team, we talked about that, it may be considered competitive for one reason or another. The uh, media agency may feel that uh, affiliates are a threat because again, they, they're they less than, they they are not as legitimate because there's no way an affiliate can be as good as, as we are because we're a company, we're a media agency, you, know, you, can't, you can't be better than us. This is an issue we frequently, um, we work with a lot of clients and some that already have established relationships with media media agencies and uh, oftentimes affiliates just off limits and then you start drilling in trying to find out well why not uh, you know they're just sort of portrayed as this bogeyman they're going to drive up our costs and then they're going to compete with us in page search and you can as rarely get your finger on a real issue you don't have to work and communicate kind of work through all the misconceptions because we realize affiliate doesn't have the visibility that paid search has um, or display has so there, you, you actually do need to fight those battles sometimes and, and present that you know, this, is, this is how it works and it's done in a professional way. Um, I, I have to say I do, I feel like I'm fighting this battle a little bit less today than we did years ago. Um, I'm really excited that I mean, this year alone we launched two very large brands, both Red Roof Inn and Tony Nask Magazines. Um, they were, both were incredibly excited about new launches of their affiliate. You, know, you would think that big brands like that would have had an affiliate program years ago. Um, but you know they're they're both you know 100% behind the channel. They're not. It's not. They're going into this with this fear or, or anything else. They yeah. know that it's critical for their. And Brad, you stars. mentioned uh, that that company that had an eight-year-old affiliate program that had one of the best return on ad spending of uh, any of their other program <laughs> nixed the program because of one person's perception. Yeah, it, it can really be devastating. Uh, like you just said, you just have to work through it. And you have to be proactive in educating even when there's not an issue. And the issue can just pop up all of a sudden. And I feel like sometimes it's going to be the, the bogeyman. If something happened, a paid search, an MER, maybe it went down, or just, there was some blip on the radar. Occasionally, affiliates can be drawn out, particularly if the, the programs aren't being managed transparently and there's not a lot of communication and you don't know what they're doing, then they get blamed for things. Well, you know, it must be the, the placard, must be the affiliate's fault. You know, it's like a go to. And I remember you just mentioning that guy that has the opinion. Some guy sits into a, a meeting with a media agency and all of the key players in the, the media side of the company and says, uh, I think the affiliates are just. Well, yeah, no, he, the numbers were great. It was, the, it was the most profitable program they had, and he got up in front of the whole round table of all the vendors and said, I absolutely know something's wrong with this data. There's just got to be something that's wrong about this, and we just can't figure yeah. it out. And so they, you know, they, they did kill the program. They just didn't, you know. And there's not much you can do about that if he, had, he wields that much power. Okay, and so the, right here, the CEO and other executives, there was a an IAB study done in November, and again, I apologize that you know, it's difficult to see these slides will be available afterwards for those of you with the, uh, I mean, if you're here, they'll be available. <coughs> um, but it says half of the respondents said that the knowledge at CEO level of affiliate marketing was little or none. So half the CEOs out there don't even know an affiliate program exists. And if the CEO doesn't know the, the program exists, then obviously there's work that needs to be done to 
yeah, as CFOs and uh, can be one of your best allies. I've seen a lot of times a CFO can be a better ally than you be CEO. And you were saying you know, what the, CEO, the, the C level execs <laughs> in general are probably located to a lot of the C level execs don't even know. Right. It depends on obviously the size and scale of the company. If you're a you know, Fortune 100 company, the C level, they're going to have a very minor awareness because it may only be a fraction of a percent of their total sales. Okay, so and then how is affiliate marketing? Oh, I went the wrong way. Oh, how is affiliate marketing perceived by those in the trenches? And so we looked at it uh, how people in the company may perceive it. But it says here 93% of respondents said they would re recommend affiliate marketing. So these are people who actually run programs and have, have been working with them. 93% of them would recommend that you do that. And that's, that's a uh, pretty solid number. Um, the next P is politics. And how much do personal politics and incentives play a role? And I, I always talk about the misaligned incentives. So if I'm dealing with somebody who uh, they're getting compensated based on how well the dealer channel does, and that dealer channel is paying three times as much as the affiliate channel, if I'm in a, a room with people and saying, okay, what can we do to increase affiliate sales? Okay, well, these dealers are actually kind of overstepping their bounds and doing these things that are making it so that their prices are less than affiliates and yada, 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 and coupons and all of the stuff that happens. And then the, the guy in charge of the dealer channel is going to say, no, we're not going to restrict them. We're going to let the dealers run free because his incentive is dealer channel needs to do as much as possible because he's getting paid for that. But the company's best interest would be for the affiliate channel to do well simply because, again, it's the most profitable. So individual in incentives may be at odds. Um, they may feel that affiliate is a threat to their existing programs. And again, certain people may criticize without all the facts, as in uh, Brad's example. Okay, the next P is for programs. Um, so if we've established that you've, you've created something that, that you can sell and you can sell directly through your online uh, or your e-commerce site, Somebody comes in and they type it in, and you um, complete a sale that way. That's obviously going to be the most profitable way to, to make a sale. Then uh, SEO is typically quite profitable as well, as long as it's done right. It's kind of still got the uh, black magic feel to it. But when your site is built, you definitely need to build it with SEO in mind, and it can be quite profitable. But affiliates. Um, it's a set price like we talked about, where SEO may go up and down, SEM may go up and down, retargeting goes up and down. These other other things, um, it's a variable cost, but it's still, it can be quite profitable and they're still competing against other, other channels. And you know, the, the, I guess the one of the least talked about things in all of this is how much each of these things are impacting each other. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of clients having discussions around attribution and just how much each uh, individual piece contributes to the whole. Um, a lot of people are still double tracking, double counting everything. I mean, I think we started seeing this in 2002 or 2003 that people started asking the questions of, you know, oh, my search agency shows a thousand sales and affiliate shows a thousand sales, yet I only have 1,500 customers. How is that? Um, and uh, you know, the last two or three years, if we Technology is starting to develop around that, um, but there's still very few brands that are actually implementing a real cohesive strategy around the affiliate contributed, you know, 10% of this sale and uh, you know, 50% of this other type of sale. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that's a, a huge shift that's going to happen over the next few years, but uh, you know, the brands aren't quite ready for it yet. Technology is starting to get there. Yeah, multi-channel attribution has been talked about over the last couple of years, and it's. It would be nice if it was easy to implement and easy to understand where all of the value is coming from. But like you said, there are certain companies that really work on that to try to understand where is the value coming from and how do I set this up. I mean, I, I always tell a company, you need to have a range. You're going to have a range of, say, 12 to 15 percent that you would be happy all day long to uh, have sales come through at. And then if they fit, you can, you can custom, customize Some affiliates get 12 percent. Different performers get 15 percent, but you need some sort of a range to where sales are going to be coming through at, at uh, the level that is commensurate with the 
the value they're providing. And realistically, companies are going to have to make some tough decisions. They're spending a lot of money in a lot of different areas, and right now, you know, sort of everybody's getting credit for that stuff, and they're going to have to make some decisions to say, you know what, when we spend money on TV or searches, it's not always going to count for these, those orders that came in. 20% of that might have to get counted towards the affiliate channel, or vice versa. Affiliate commissions might have to decrease by 50% because they're only influencing the sale, you know, half as much as we thought they really were. And it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for sure. Um, so for programs, again, online marketing is infinitely trackable. You, you have ways to understand your return on investment or return on ad spend, media expense ratio, cost per acquisition, whatever it is that you hold those programs accountable to, they are completely accountable because they're 100% they're trackable. Um, and so almost all of your online programs can be held to performance-based metrics. And if it's performance-based, then to cap the budget on it can be um, unwise in my opinion, especially in the, the affiliate marketing space. Or you have the other online programs where they're a little bit more variable. Having an unlimited budget, we talked about this last night, an unlimited budget might be a little bit riskier, but with affiliate, again, it's a set um, price that you're, you're paying per sale, so to cap it is just giving opportunity to the affiliates riding that up and down in their profit margin. Yeah, you know, yeah. you move that burden onto them, you know, and that's one of the major advantages. Yeah, and that's, that's also one of the uh, double-edged swords for affiliates because one month, their profit margins may have been a little stronger than the month prior, or and then it will dip. And I've, I've talked to them uh, over the last couple of days where they say, "Yeah, I, I was making a thousand dollars a month with this program, and it went down to 500." It's the same traffic, and and they don't have any insight as to what's going on, and so they're kind of in the dark. They're taking all that risk, and they don't have the insight that, that full teams have. Is anybody in the room doing retargeting? Can you raise your hand. Are you doing CPA retargeting? No. I, there's a lot of people that are doing CPA retargeting that have no idea uh, how many other channels might be getting credit for the same exact sale. Um, it, it's, it's actually mind boggling. That there might be four different people that are all raising their hands saying, I want credit for that sale, and they're paying out multiple times. Um, it's that in a lot of cases, it's more profitable to be doing retargeting on a CPM or CPC than it is on a CPA. It's like the one area of uh, performance marketing that might be more efficient to not pay on a, on a so guarantee. So what can you do to combat, combat that, or is there? You have to have uh, strict deal terms in place to know that are you, you know, when you're doing a CPA retargeting campaign, are you paying only on uh, click-through to sale conversion or only unique conversions? Uh, or is it at literally every sale that, that may have been influenced? And the CPA retargeters will say, I don't know if there's any in the room, hopefully not, uh, they'll say they want credit for every sale, they, whether they, there was a click involved or not. Interesting. Okay, um, the next couple slides just kind of give you an idea of where affiliate stacks up against other programs. We have other programs like paid search, contextual retargeting, social, YouTube, shopping. Um, typically, affiliate, if you built your program right again, Affiliate programs should have the highest return on your ad spend, and then your cost per acquisition, conversely, should be the, uh, the lowest of any of your other channels. Um, here's another IAB study from November. Um, online marketing spend uh, attributed to the affiliate channel, and here it shows that uh, they spend less than 51% of respondents said they spend less than 10% of online marketing in the affiliate channel. If it's your most profitable channel, then why is it that, that only 10% of your spend or less is actually focused on affiliate? If you took a little bit more time and effort, put some more resources behind it, you could bolster this channel that is far more profitable. And it, it's just amazing to me to see studies like this. So, conclusions. Um, you're setting up a business, you say, you have to ask yourself, what commission rate am I most comfortable with to where if I make sales at this rate, I can make them all day long? And if you do that, then it just simply comes down to scalability. Because again, you cap it, then you're giving your competitors a chance to feel how happy you were for that uh, competitor capping their thing. People will just totally take that traffic that's already out there and uh, steal it from you. So you should never cap it. It's just a matter of scalability. If you if you figure out how to build your program to where you say, if I got had to only pay 18% a sale or 20% per sale, I would do this all day long and we would be happy with it.
and it just it really comes down to scalability. And again, it's never quite that black and white, but uh, in general. As much as I was celebrating, I've also been on the other side where I've had a client say, you know what, we're, we're running out of budget this quarter, you guys got to slow down. So uh, I'd love to say it's perfect. Yeah, and then that makes you want to scream and say, you know what, you're, you're killing me, right? Yeah, and, it, and it's that ongoing conversation of how do we change those perceptions at the higher level so we don't run into that in the future. Okay, so in summary, sales that happen directly on your website are among the most profitable. Uh, sales that happen through a retail partner or other sites, um, they're not as profitable and you don't capture the customer data. That's one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is when you give all of those sales away to one of these other channels, they get all the customer data. And one of your most valuable assets can be your in-house marketing. I know that's been the case with some of our clients and it's you're just giving that away when you, when you push those efforts to the uh, retail and other channels. So affiliate marketing is one of the most cost-effective ways to drive sales online. Maximizing the number of sales through your affiliate channel should be one of the number one goals of your or marketing department. So I, I kind of ended here with it saying, you know, if if this is the case, why are you limiting my opportunity to make money for the company? I think that's a feeling that a lot of people have. So I'll I'll open it up to questions. We have about looks like ten minutes on the dot. Right here. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm, uh, I'm from the UK, I'm from England. Um, and the issue of advocacy is something that we talk a lot about over there, and it's something I've noticed has come up in a few of the sessions. My question is basically what, who do you think, who is the partner between networks, agencies, affiliates, and, and advertisers that needs to be pulling their weight more? Is it that networks need to be conducting, giving more kind of face-to-face -face meetings between advertisers and publishers? Is it that the affiliates need to give uh, more information to advertisers to showcase themselves better? Is it that there's a lack of advertisers talking up the affiliate channel? Or then let's, you know, we need more case studies, testimonies? Yes, to all that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. They all sound good, uh, they? Uh, Honestly, yeah. I mean, I don't know how different the market is over in the UK compared to here. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, so the role of the networks and the role of the agencies is a little bit different. Um, I think it, uh, it's much more common to outsource the management of your program there than it is uh, here in the U.S. Um, but I think everybody needs to be the advocate. And, and you know, these are real, big, strategic deals that have the potential to re to generate a lot of money. Yes, there are a lot of mom and pops who are very content with generating $100 in commissions every month. Um, but there's just as many, you know, 50 to 100 person or or more businesses that are. You know, legitimate media companies that that are acting on a, they're working on a performance basis, and uh, you know that that perception needs to change. Yeah, when you mention affiliate, I just think you know affiliates a lot of times don't may not feel like they have the weight or they carry the weight to really make an impact, but affiliates are becoming much more um, they're they're incredible. In PubCon a couple of months ago here, some of the affiliates that stood out were basically doing a better job of showcasing. Uh, a retailers goods and services than the retailer does and so like hipmonk.com I don't know if any of you if any of you haven't heard of hipmonk it's h-i-p-m-u-n-k uh, like chipmunk without the c I would recommend you do it and they're simply an affiliate and their whole model is giving you flight information or hotel information that sucks the least I think is their <laughs> it's a beautiful interface and it gets you what you want and that final click We'll send you to Orbitz, or we'll send you to XP, or one of these other ones. But they've got you what you want, and an affiliate like that becomes a company, you know, and, and that's happening more and more. Yeah, I mean, I mean from our perspective as well, you know, when I look at the, the UK market, and maybe this is true of the US, it's, there's more of an education process needed on the part of advertisers to recognise that publishers are in some cases larger than the brands that they're promoting, so they are the famous brands in their own right. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, certainly one of the things from a network perspective is being able to give affiliates the tools to kind of showcase themselves as such, to, to showcase their size and, uh, sure. and you know, how they can represent not just a good driver of sales, good incremental sales, but how they strengthen an advertiser's brand. That's a great point. If you look at the largest loyalty publishers out there, like You Promise, and Fat Wallet, I mean, they each have millions of yeah. members, and then you know there are a lot of brands out there that 
you know, don't reach that kind of level of, of membership and return customers and transaction levels. Um, and uh, you know, events like this are great because you know, lots of we're bringing our clients and our brands face to face with our affiliates whenever possible. Um, setting up those meetings, having those conversations, but this is exactly how this company is promoting your brand and how it's unique and how this is something you can't do yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori from um, Super Parks and Entertainment. So I, I definitely have a question even about the attribution modeling. Um, we are absolutely in the, in the case of trying to consider whether or not to implement that type of um, solution because we as you like alluded to, you know, do you see some discrepancies um, every now and again with multiple channels receiving uh, credit for the sale? So do you have any examples of recent brands that have actually implemented um, the model and have been able to eliminate those discrepancies and or what that's done within the organizations internally? Um, I was having a conversation with the uh, gentleman in the back from, uh, from a company, that, a tagman who deals in attribution, and we're saying, you know, how uh, you know, getting the installation is, is a, a huge uphill battle. Um, we were discussing situations where clients are taking over a year to actually just do the install alone. Um, usually what I recommend is looking at as much existing data as you can before you even uh, talk to, to, to a, an attribution company. Because if you look at, start looking at your own data, just start with like all the order IDs you have and say, you know, here's the amount of overlap and here are the, the, the areas that they're overlapping the most. You might be able to make some financial decisions of saying, Okay, I need to reduce my CPA and surge by 20%. I need to maybe you know, decrease affiliate here and maybe increase display over here. Um, you know, there, I don't know of uh, any company, I don't know of a case study where a, a company has implemented it and saved this much money. Um, I know that by looking at the raw data, we've consulted with our, company, our clients and said, and said, we recommend you know, adjusting commissions here or adjusting your CPA you know, thresholds in these different areas. Um, but I, you probably have a, a lot of data already to start with, um, and uh, I would say you know have those conversations with the attribution companies because they probably have those case studies, um, and uh, yeah, know and that. They, and they do. I was just wondering if you had any specific. No, I, I think what what I would um, probably caution anybody in looking at this is no, like what are you going to do? But once you know the information, are you going to actually make a decision and say, I'm now going to count things differently or I'm now going to pay out differently? Because right. what I've seen more often than not is that people, they look at the data and then everything stays the same. Right. And that's a discussion we've had where, you know, you, you find this out. So we know that these, things, these issues exist, but how do I fix them? And, you know, we didn't want this to be a, a session that was just about, you know, what this is happening in companies and what a shame and what a shame. What are you going to do about it? You know, what can we do about it? So I appreciate that question from before. And I think it, it takes everyone just continually pushing to, to make some headway on this. I'll say that in that retargeting area is the one where I've seen the most action taken because I think that's it creates the most uh, potential for overlap. Because remember, these are all you're, you're showing ads to people who visited your site already, so they had to they had to have started from somewhere else. Um, it, it's almost guaranteed overlap and double counting. <laughs> Any other questions? Are you seeing contractually um, the way you approach contracts to be different when it comes to split commissions? So the, I asked the same question yesterday about if you look at the top of the funnel, you've got skim links, and that's the, the, the third kind of interest shown, and then at the bottom you've got that retargeting. So how are you now approaching that with the, the affiliates, the actual contractual side? We will share a certain percentage of that commission with you, but not for whack. Skim links is an, an interesting animal. I mean, I've heard a lot of pluses and minuses about working with them, you know, and, and I just, I know that I've heard they're an EPC killer and I've kind of seen that they just, they're so prevalent, but they're not necessarily going to converge at a higher rate than, than other um, publishers. And so paying them a smaller commission because of, of their model, like, again, it comes down to knowing what sort of value they add um, and compensating them accordingly. But as far as contractually, I don't know. How you go about that? Well, yeah, I think you do. I mean, you you, you say, you know, like you know, the retargeting example, you say, you know what, I'm not going to pay you on every sale. I'm only going to pay you in these circumstances or uh, with an affiliate that is sort of a, la a very last touch affiliate, like a coupon who you may, a coupon site that you may have allowed to bid on brand. You know, I'm only going to pay you 2% while I'm paying other people 4%. Um, so I think those, those elements definitely do come in. 
And I, I know you can set those rates within the network you're using. Um, or I'm going to pay you on a different return rate, uh, you know, the number of return days. I'm only going to pay you for, you know, the customers come back within the first 24 hours, where with somebody else I might do it within two weeks or something like that. Does that help? I know it's kind of a... No, no, it's just interesting because we're seeing more clients, sorry if I was tagging, but uh, we're seeing more clients splitting that commission. Uh, and a lot of the major networks are saying, no, we're not going to do it. And then when they go back and say, here's, here's an audited proof that I shouldn't be paying you this, yeah. they kind of change their mind. So I was just wondering how people are actually approaching it, if you are. I think it's evolving, and I, I think that uh, hopefully by next year this time we'll have some case studies on it. If you know what you can afford to pay, and you know that you know I'm not going to pay more than this rate, the, some of those contractual elements become a lot easier. I, you know, I, with, with the clients who have looked at that data really long and hard, as much as they may want an additional source of volume, they're not willing to lose uh, lose money on every order that comes in. Okay, well, up front. Um, you pointed out throughout the presentation, the issues and challenges that come with regard to the mix of media within a company and everybody can't just get along. Uh, have you found any methodologies in dealing with it, uh, advertisers that uh, get them to a point where they get it, that there are synergies within the, the, the media channels that they're deploying? Here's how they impact each other, such that the uh, the whole is greater than the greater than the parts. I, I, you know, it's kind of comes down to politics too, and, and how willing I, I've dealt with companies where the CEO is going to protect his his buddies, you know, who are the other C-level execs, and then he'll say, you know what. I know that if I keep feeding these channels that are less profitable as a company, I have more loyalty from my, my team. And it seems to be being done at the expense of the company, again, giving away uh, a lot of the margins they don't need to be getting away. And so it, it kind of depends on, on who the ultimate decision maker is and if they're willing to put politics aside. I've said it a couple of times, an agnostic, basically they can't play favorites or they can't get into all of those politics because if they do, they're going to be willing to give up those those higher margins just to, you know, keep the peace, I guess, in their own company. I don't know. Yeah, so no, I, I, I think they're, they're not even paying attention to the facts. So, well, at least in this particular case, okay. and, and that and it's mind-boggling. And, and you want to you shake them and say, do you realize how much money you're giving away? And uh, there's not much you can do. To I guess I'm lucky in the regard that at the point a client hires us, they've already made a commitment to this channel. Um, they're not going to spend money and get and get help. And, and, but a, a lot of it is what this gentleman from the UK mentioned, where it is about advocacy and education. Um, and uh, we fight these battles all the time. We've done it for many years. But you know, the higher up the food chain you can go, and you can have these real conversations of this is what this site is doing, and this is how they're promoting our brand. Um, you know. The more education and awareness, uh, you know, we believe in complete 100% transparency. It's the only way to get around a lot of these things. You can't just say, you know, here's your report with you know, a total number of sales and be done with it. Um, it really is about this is these are strategic partners and this is how they're they're promoting the brand and um, you know having that awareness and education. And like Brad said, you need to be proactive about it because you don't want for a problem to come up and then that be the catalyst for that discussion because then it's always negative. You know, if you prep them and give them the idea, look, these are the things that might happen, and, and like Chris says, complete transparency, hopefully that's going to, to work in your favor when some of these issues arise. And, 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 you know, realistically, staffing is a big issue because, you know, I, I can't tell you that the more understaffed an affiliate program is, the more likely these issues tend to occur. Uh, because there isn't somebody there being the advocate and saying, hey, you know what, here's this great site and a really cool way that they're promoting us that we never even thought of. Yeah. And then part of the media point. team is, you know, the, the politics internally on the, on the media team or the, inside the marketing department. Usually in my experience, we have several different entities all working together and um, you have, even within, amongst yourself, the affiliate just one component, that really proactive relationship and trying to give credit to the other side, even when their own tracking isn't counting something, and saying, well, look, and that's kind of, several people have touched on this, and the multi-touch conversions and these analytics themselves, you know, we kind of have this false belief that, oh, we have all this data now, but it's, it's still just data, and, and it's got all kinds of holes in it, 
the more the more you drill in, sometimes the more questions you have. So you have to kind of take the data for what it is, and these multi-touch conversion data is very illuminating. And I think a couple guys said, you know, they, they find out what it is, and they don't make any changes, but you're, at least you're better informed. And you, that's kind of the attitude you really need to have. It's like, look, no one channel is going to dominate. No one program is going to drive 100%. Or, you know. It's really just all about attitude. It's certainly easier to say than to do. And, and sometimes the partners you, you know you're working with don't share, and some of the education is that you really amongst your team. And like Chris was saying too, it's it's always fun to see an affiliate that's doing something innovative, to where you find that and say, holy cow, that is really smart. I've had that happen a number of times, and you just you have to appreciate it and say, wow, that that's great. And if you don't have your affiliate program managed properly or staffed properly. You're going to miss a lot of that. You're going to have people doing things that, that with just a little nudge in one direction or another, that affiliate to take off for you. So um, we are just barely over time. I want to remind you, if you would, to, to please fill these out. And if you have any additional questions, feel free to, to come on up and ask us personally. Thank you.